Babylon gets very spiritual uh, because it's Babel. And those of you who know um, the story or went to the WebEx last time uh, know that Babel is Babylon. We will do a quick review. Babel, and this is part two again, Babel, meaning the gate of God or gate of the gods, the L in some Near Eastern uh, or Semitic, Northwest Semitic languages uh, means gods, but uh, gate of the gods, that, that has significance. Uh, the city of Nimrod wanted access to heaven by building a tower to reach there, as we all know, or some of us know. Um, they wanted to be in contact with all the spiritual things they had been supposedly denied them on earth with the mindset of the firmament above them, and that's what the critical aspect of last time's teaching, last month's teaching, uh, the building of the tower, and I gave you the Greek, uh, Greek Hebrew there, uh, to get the, the building of the tower to get there, which was heaven, was not something weird to them. It was probably, you know, very understandable. We could read, I mean, they could, they'd seen birds flying in the clouds. They figured they could get there. The clouds were in the firmament as were the stars, the sun, the heavens, you know, the moon, according to Genesis 1, you can read the record. But before the time of Nimrod, uh, most likely nobody was as arrogant uh, as uh, these guys uh, in the time of Babel. So just before the Babel incident, this was what made me teach on the subject last time, um, the incident uh, Recorded in the scripture, God separated the nations into their own lands. Those are the references, again, from last month's teaching. And this uh, sentence of Noah, his sons after the ark. Um, further, uh, the main event last time was that the boundaries, maybe it was the second main event, first one being understanding the firmament and that Babel, the Tower of Babel, could get to heaven in their own worldview, their construct of what the firmament was, a dome, a, a dome over the, the, the flat earth. But the, the second most important thing, and maybe it was a little more important, was that God set the boundaries of those nations according to the number of the sons of God, correct reading textually from Deuteronomy 32.8 um, from the uh, Septuagint and the reading of uh, one of the Isaiah, excuse me, one of the Deuteronomy scrolls in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I gave you those references in the PDF uh, had you wanted that PDF. Um, and we see the spirit, those spirits in action in other places. There's a couple of them here. You know, reading this month to prepare for this teaching, I just saw so many more places where, and we'll, we'll get into the reading of the scriptures here, uh, continuing on with uh, Babylon, the greatest fallen. And you'll see that these nations and the I've decided to call them divine entities. You know, I kept calling them spiritual entities. I wanted some force behind it. Divine entities. These dudes were the quote unquote gods. Thou shalt have no more no other gods before me. The little G O D S, same Hebrew word Elohim. Um, these guys were powerful. And so let's I'm I'm gonna try to change my mindset here and instead of calling them angels, which has got a really weird connotation in the in the Western mind of fluffy, you know, fat cherubs, um, you know, even spiritual entities, that's kind of a long, protracted thing. But divine entities, that gets people's attention. These were the gods of old <clears throat> that you weren't supposed to worship. They were angelic beings, yes. Maybe I should do a WebEx on how, how that changed between the Hebrew, the Greek, you know, to the to the Christian scriptures and how important that is to the understanding of the spiritual battle, um, but these um, these nations were under the auspices, under the control. They 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 were governed in some regard by these spiritual or divine entities, uh, and and we go through that in the other um, webex. But God chose for Himself one nation that actually didn't even exist then. He <laughs> called Abraham, and out of Abraham's loins became. Um, you know, the nation of Israel eventually, singling them out as the apple, or in the Hebrew, the pupil of his eye, protecting these people from whence would come the Redeemer of all mankind, ye old anointed one, Mashiach, Messiah, Jesus. He 
God, the Most High, protected the Christ line in a wonder, in the wonderful various ways we read about in the Hebrew Scriptures. So that was last WebEx. Let's get into this one. One thing before we move into the uh, next one is I <laughs> had been reading a lot of things um, in Genesis, and it, it, it occurred to me that one verse of Scripture here in Genesis 10.25, two sons were born to Eber. Uh, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided. That, that's the Hebrew for survey, or divided into grids, and his brother's name was Jokin. And I thought to myself, uh, wow, I missed this in the last WebEx. I, and, and here it is. For many years, my young earth creationist proclivities, and by that, I mean I was a guy that believed that the earth was very young, under 10,000 years old, and... Uh, it made me look at the division noted here in Genesis 10:25 uh, of the Earth's day in Pele, uh, of the Earth in Pele's day was something geophysical. The, the Pangaea was separated the supercontinent into land masses that we see on the planet today, and it happened right there in 2200 BC, sometime in there. Well, that's not only bad theology, that's letting something that may have occurred, it has never been proven and is scientifically quite nebulous and uh, probably very much a pseudoscience. But that letting that idea, because someone threw it at me, it had to happen between, you know, Genesis 1 and Genesis 10, that letting that develop your theological system or your belief system, that's just horrible. But if you look at what was going on in Genesis 10 and seeing that the word is the survey divided into grids, any one of you can answer the question as to what that means. And so I just wanted you to have that other scripture in your back pocket before we proceeded. <clears throat> Between the Tower of Babel incident and Bethlehem, the Hebrew prophets uh, rarely, rarely speak spoke of Babel, uh, uh, let me let me rephrase that, between, oh, I'll give you all the information right here, it, it never became a power, sort of, it, Babel sort of disappeared from the pages of scripture for over 17 centuries, okay, not until Isaiah started to prophesy, and I gave you the dates here, did Babel come back on the scene. And we're going to get into that. Uh, there's one mention in Joshua of a Babylonish garment that came into the camp, and it's, you can read the, you can read that if you Google it or you uh, you get into your uh, concordance and look up Babylonish. Um, and people think that that was something that was going on in Babylon at that time, but really in the Hebrew, it's a beautiful mantle from Shinar, not necessarily Babylon. Uh, but the point here with this screen is that. As we are into Babylon, the second part here, 17 centuries. So after the Tower incident, um, it disappears from the pages of Scripture until Isaiah brings it back forward. And we'll see that in 2 Kings 20, as I put at the bottom here. And I want to say one other thing. I bet you guys think that the Tower was destroyed, that God wrecked the Tower just as he confused the languages. I've had that in my mind for years. I went back and read, and the tower doesn't say anything about that. <laughs> I just thought it was awesome how many things I have to unlearn regarding Babel. So um, here we go. So Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of four Hebrew kings, uh, and there they are, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He prophesied, and this is very cool nearly 60 years, and I'm going to give you the chart here in the next slide, under which kings under which kings, and the dates thereof, and again, you'll have this PDF if you want it, uh, so you can have it in your, uh, in your uh, notebook. Uh, he was born in 760, and Uzziah died in 740, so possibly he was very young, Isaiah, when he first began to speak for God, maybe even a teenager. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and Hezekiah, the last king, died around 687, so that's possibly 70. Some other people, I've given you three dates here, 60, 70, and some people think he might have even prophesied uh, when he was 80 or even um, 
uh, 80 years worth of prophecy. So, you know, I'll tell you right now, I'm not a chronological guru. Uh, a lot of my former colleagues in the research department used to love that stuff. Um, I occasionally would get into it. This one helps. Again, here's the chart um, in the red and shows you Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of those those four kings. And, you know, he was a pretty old guy according to ancient standards, even though the original guys in Genesis lived for 900 years. By the time you get to 700 B.C., people weren't living that long, and Isaiah's prophesying he's a very, very old guy. So let's get into the first um, thing that Isaiah notices about Babylon. And you guys, a lot of you guys know this story. We're going to read it. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, came to see him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order. You're going to die. Uh, then he turned his face to the wall, prayed to the Lord, saying, Oh, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you. This is, this is uh, Hezekiah. I beseech you how I have walked before you in truth, uh, and with a whole heart, and I've done what's good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. So before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him saying, oh, turn around, dude, and go talk to Isaiah, uh, Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus said the Lord your God, Father of David, I've heard your prayer, I've seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, the temple. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city uh, from the king of Assyria. <laughs> so the king of Assyria was um, outside the gates of Jerusalem at this time, okay? Not anything about Babel. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. <laughs> not for yours. <laughs> that's, that's not written there, but, I mean, what do you take away from an ellipsis? Then Isaiah says, take a cake of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil. So it was a boil he had, and he recovered. Got to have the big cakes to do a boil. Now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, this will be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he's spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? Hezekiah said, well, it's easy to go forward. Let's go back. And that happened. Uh, Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord. He brought the shadow on the stairway back ten steps, by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz, which was the place nearby. So here's the more important part. We were talking, the, the king of Assyria is outside the gates. There's a lot of other stories here in Kings about the Assyrian kingdom. I did a lot of study in that um, because of the Aramaic nature of the, the, at that time, the kingdom of Assyria, I studied a lot of that while I was in school. But at that time, Barodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard Hezekiah had been sick. What a nice guy. Nice gesture. Well, here's where we get into the problem. Hezekiah listened to them. It was... You'll see who them is. And showed them all the treasures, treasure house, silver and gold, spices, precious oils, house of armor, all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said, What did these men say? And from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, Oh, they came from a far country, from Babylon. <clears throat> what have they seen in your house? says Isaiah. So Hezekiah said, oh, I showed him all, all that is in my house, and there is nothing among my treasures that I haven't shown him. Then Isaiah, <laughs> there's the Isaiah, oh man, hear the word of the Lord, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day are going to be carried away there. Nothing shall be left. Now, wow, take the occasion here to think about this. Um, I just think it's, when we get into reading Isaiah the prophet, you know, his writings, his own writings, of course, this was the writing of the author of the Book of Kings, you'll see some stuff. This must have been a turning point for Isaiah, because from this point on out, there is almost nothing that he doesn't say about Babylon, and we're going to read it. 
Um, but he's telling Hezekiah, you're going to have all your, your entire stuff taken away to Babylon. And, of course, this happens around, I think it's 586, 200 years from this prophecy. It comes to pass that the, uh, the deportations of the children of Israel occur to Babylon because Babylon takes over from the Assyrian Empire and becomes a big powerhouse. But here's the rest of it. Verse 19, then Isaiah said, <clears throat> uh, the word of the Lord which you have spoken to me is good. What, that you're getting all your stuff taken away? For he thought, listen to this, it is, is it not so if there will be peace and truth in my days? Sounds like a welfare case here, folks. So long as I'm okay, I don't care what the future holds. So long as my needs are met, the future kingdom can go to hell in a handbasket. Really, think about this. So now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might <clears throat> and how he made the pool and the conduit, brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh soon became king in his place. <clears throat> so yes, um, here's the prophecy, the first one that I know of, uh, that occurred in prediction form uh, by Isaiah regarding the kingdom of Babylon. So we do know that they were carried away, as I say, in 586 or so. Well, there were three deportations, so we won't go to – well, let's go back to that chart and see when they were. Do they show – uh, oh, I had it right. The, um, at the bottom of this chart, 586 was the first um, carrying away. There were two others. But I wanted to show you that while Israel was in Babylon under the Babylonian captivity – um, it was really the height of degradation, degradation because God had given them this land. And here's a psalm that was written regarding their captivity. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion was home. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. There were, you know, on the banks of the east. For there they, that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth to be happy, damn it, saying, sing as one of the songs, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, which is another word for Zion, let my right hand forget her cunning, if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. And we'll get into that a little bit. Who said, raise it, raise it, even unto the foundation. In other words, destroy it, bring it to the ground, burn it. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as you served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes your little ones against the stones. <laughs> nice. Start with a song. End with a deprecation. Let's just throw your little babies against the rocks. Sorry for the mind picture, ladies. That's what this psalm was about. I tell you, I have gotten so into the psalms lately because of the well, as some of you know, the graphic nature is there. What's coming in the future is there. A lot of the stuff about the ancient Near East cosmological mindset is there. The celestial sea is there. The angels of destruction are there. What's going to occur and how it's going to occur are there. And that's kind of why it's come alive in the last 10 years for me. I just used to never read this song. Boy, what can you get from it? So... Uh, as we read at the end of Kings, you know, the, the stuff on Hezekiah is written in the book of the Chroniclers. I thought I'd give you this one last uh, insight into Babylon. Even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only uh, to test him, Hezekiah, that he might know all that was in his I, Hezekiah's heart. I thought that, you know, this is... Typically, when you read Chronicles, it's from God's perspective. And as we may have been taught, some of you, that Kings is from 
um, a, a more man's or an earthly perspective. This is kind of a heavenly perspective. So the prophecies of Isaiah start where I want to start tonight anyway. Is, uh, is Isaiah 13.1, and it ends in 14.32. Many of you who had heard my teaching, Lucifer and Jesus, are going to see a couple of, of the same slides here tonight. Well, it's because uh, Isaiah prophesies about Babylon is the reason why we're going to do it. And you know that those, ver those chapters, 13.1 through 14.32, are all about the shining one, son of the dawn, also known as Lucifer, but we don't use that word around here because that's not in the text. It's the shining one, son of the dawn. Matters. It's a big deal. Get that other word out of your vocabulary. Lucifer is not in the text. It's the shining one, son of the dawn. But let's get into it. I want to start at the end and go back to the middle. Focus on the end of Isaiah 14 and Babylon. For the Lord Almighty has purposed and who can thwart him? Good rhetorical question. His hand is stretched out. Who can turn it back? The oracle, or it's called the burden, or the lifting, uh, came in the year of King Ahaz. Do not rejoice, all you Philistines, that the rod that struck you is broken. From the root of that snake will spring up a viper. Its fruit will be a darting venomous serpent. The poorest of the poor will find pasture, and the needy will lie down in safety. But your root I will destroy by famine. I will slay your survivors. Wail, O gate. Howl, O city. Melt away, all you Philistines. A cloud of smoke comes from the north, and there is not a straggler in its ranks. What answer shall be given to the envoys of that nation? <laughs> we just read about the envoys of that nation in Chronicles. The Lord has established Zion, and in her, his afflicted people will find refuge. A couple notes here. We probably won't get into it much. The poorest of the poor will find pasture. It sounds like the Beatitudes. That's because the poorest of the poor are the coachables, the poor in spirit from Luke and Matthew, and they will be receiving a kingdom. Uh, and then here, cloud of smoke comes from the north. I just want you to think, because we're going to get back to this first, a logical person here is reading to him or herself, how does, a sm how does smoke have stragglers in the first place? And then the final question on this slide, which is the most important question, is what city are we talking about here? Well, can't know the uh, city unless you read the context, then here's the context. What city is Isaiah talking about? The remoter context, 13 through 14, tells us it's Babylon. 13.1, oracle concerning Babylon. Uh, Isaiah 13.19, and Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldean pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and the Gomorrah. 14.4, we're into the shining one, son of the dawn context, that you will take up this taunt. This is Isaiah who was instructed to take up a taunt. What a word, great word, against the king of Babylon, a.k.a. Shining One, Son of the Dawn, if you heard the Lucifer teaching. Uh, and how do you say the oppressor has ceased? How has the fury ceased? Okay, are you feeling it? Are you feeling the day of the Lord? Because that's what we're talking about here. So in the last context here that tells us what city that Isaiah is talking about in the last verse of the context is prepare for his sons a place of slaughter because of the iniquities of their fathers. We're talking about the king of Babylon, Lu Lucifer or shining one, son of the dawn. They must not arise and take possession of the earth. That has to do with coming alive from the dead because God is not going to raise them from the dead and fill the face of the world with cities. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts. There it is. I will cut Lord of the armies. January's teaching. I will cut off from Babylon name and survivors, offspring and posterity, declares the Lord. So that's the city we're talking about in the context. Let's get into it. Some of you know this, that 13, 1 through 8, the burden of Babylon, which the son of Amaz did see. Lift ye up a banner upon a high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones, the Kodashim, 
I have called my mighty ones, the Giborim, that's parallel and prophet in poetic, in the Hebrew, those are parallel words there. The Kodashim are the Giborim, and this is God speaking through Amos, uh, Isaiah. For I've called them for my anger, even that them that rejoice in my highness. <laughs> They're in heaven, they like that God is the high, the high one. They rejoice in that. They rejoice in the, my highness. So we're talking about the divine council here, the sancti the holy ones, sanctified ones. Okay, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like that of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdom of the, of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. We're talking about spiritual entities, divine entities here. These are not people. It's like as of a great people. We'll get, there are going to be some parallel verses here that are going to rock your world. They come from a far country. Where? From the end of heaven. And, and for, remember, ancient Near East cosmology, what's the end of heaven? As far away as you could see. Where the dome, the firmament, came down on the mountains. So that's where these dudes are coming from. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation <laughs> to do what? Destroy the whole land. Oh, golly, Bob, can we read some more? Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. That is the major theme. I mean, there's peace, love, dove, and, and that happens. But basically, day of the Lord, that's the day of destruction. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, they, they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, they shall be in pain as a woman that travails, they shall be amazed at one another, their faces shall be as flames. <laughs> this is the day of the Lord. And as I say, it's not only bad things, but there, there is definitely a lot of bad, bad things in the day of the Lord. So, continue with this Babylon, Babylon context. Not only is it about Babylon, but it's not about Babylon during Isaiah's day, even though that's laced in here in the reading of Isaiah 13 and 14. You'll see it. But behold, again, here's the next verse. The day of the Lord comes, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. Sound vaguely familiar? Yes. I read this to you when I read uh, about the shining one. <laughs> Jesus talking about it immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun will be darkened. moon shall not give her light. Did he know the Bible? Yes, he knew his Bible. And the powers of the heaven were shaken, blah, blah, blah. Verse 11 back in Isaiah. And again, you can have these, uh, these PDFs. I will punish the world for their evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to see. I will lay low the haughtiness of the what? Terrible. And these guys who governed the other nations of the world were terrible. Read about it in Psalm 82. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Why? Because most of them are dead, if you read the book of Revelation. Even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the, fierce, in the, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. The day of vengeance of our God. Okay? It's talked about in Deuteronomy. First time this period is referred to. It shall be as it shall be as a chaste row and as a sheep that no man takes up. It shall every man turn to his own people, flee into their own lands. Terrible time. Oh, oops. The end of Isaiah 13, I think here. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. Oh, thank you very much. And everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Got it, got it. Their children shall be dashed to pieces. We just read about that before. And their houses shall be spoiled, their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. Okay, we're historical now. Because when Babylon comes onto the, onto the scene, we know from Daniel that the next kingdom that takes over from it is the Mede, Median Persian Empire. Not going to get into that much tonight, but there it is. Isaiah weaves 
now and not yet. Just like, just like the Christian prophets leave the now not yet, here historically are the Medes. I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight into it. They just want to kill. They want to pillage. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellently, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? It shall never be inhabited. There shall it be dwelt from gen neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Therefore shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Uh, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, the houses will be full of doleful creatures, and you can read about them. <laughs> and owls will be there, satyrs will dance there, wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons and their pleasant palaces, and their her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. Well, it happened historically, and by the way, it's going to happen in, in the future. So that's the end of Isaiah 13, where we know we're talking about Babylon, we know we're talking about the day of the Lord, but I say again, uh, Isaiah slips in some historical stuff, but he goes back, Isaiah 14, 1, 8. Hmm. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and shall yet choose Israel and set them down in their own land. Well, where are they when he's writing? Well, they're still in the land because the 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 uh, captivity had not happened to the king of Babylon. And Isaiah's writing before, 200 years before it happens. So, you know, wow, there's a lot going on here. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, okay? And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of, of the Lord for servants and handmaids. They're going to be reversing what happened to themselves, Israel, uh, in the future. And they shall take them who took themselves captives, who ca whose captives they were. There it is. And they shall rule over their own oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give them rest from their silence. Um, so already you can see Isaiah's looking forward to after they've been cap captured, taken to Babylon, they are being drawn back and chosen, set back in their own land, and um, those who, who uh, punish them, they're going to be punished. And by the way, that never happened historically. After they were brought back from, just listen to me for a minute, that, that the uh, captors, the Babylonians that took Israel into captivity, into Babylon in 586 and subsequent, um, you know, subsequent uh, deportations. Um, and they stayed there 70 years as Jeremiah had prophesied. And then they came back. You read Ezra and Nehemiah and how Zerubbabel came first, those historical buffs of the Bible. But then from that period of time on for, I got to remember this sometime, in the 400s or so, um, there are 490 years between the the coming back from Babylon, the rebuilding of the gate, and then the temple, and then Jesus shows up. The the, the temple of Herod has been built between you know let's go let's call it 500 to zero. None of this stuff occurred where all of Israel came in and then the people that had uh, taken them into captivity became. Uh, their captives. So you have to know that this is a future event just by that alone, by the logic thereof, but you'll see very easily that it is future because in verse 4 here, uh, well, a little back in 3, and it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord will give them rest from the sorrows and from the fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou art made to serve that you <coughs> you will take up the taunt against the king of Babylon. Hmm. So here's the taunt. And say, how has the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord broke the staff of the wicked, the scepters of the rulers. And he, the king of Babylon, who smote the people in wrath and continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hinders. 
the whole earth is at rest. You think that's happened ever? And is quiet, and they break forth into singing, Yo, yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, O king of Babylon. I should have put that in here. And the cedars of Lebanon say, since you, O king of Babylon, are laid down, that's a <laughs> that's a forestry term. It cut down. No feller, no tree feller has come up against us. We're at peace finally because you took a nosedive. Here we go. I I wanted you to see. I guess I wanted to explain a few things here before I moved on. Yeah, I guess I did. Note that God said to Isaiah, "You will take up the proverb." against the king of Babylon saying the oppressor has ceased, the golden city has ceased. You know this. If you read the context of Isaiah 14, you know this isn't a human being. He's not a real, he's not an actual king. And the golden city, why is it golden? And why is it ceased? We're in the second section of Babylon the Great has fallen Context tells us that they are the Lord, so we know the one. Language seems to be the same as the book of Revelation, where the shining one, son of the dawn, and the city of Babylon, quote unquote, fall. There are no fallen angels today. Happens in the future. The devil ceases to exist, comes to nothing. The city of Babylon is doing what? Hmm. We'll get into that. And I gave you a couple of things here to show you that the shining one falls. Here in Isaiah 14:12, and the dragon falls. So you got to ask yourself: Are they equivalent? I'm saying yes, folks. Isaiah 21:9, Babylon falls. Isaiah 18:2, Babylon falls. So let's get back to the context of 14, so I don't distract you with my ramblings. 14, 9 through 17, hell, Sheol, from beneath is moved for thee, king of Babylon, remember, king of Babylon, context, to meet thee at your coming, going to hell in a handbasket, literally. It, what, hell, it stirs up the dead. Who are the dead? This is a Greek Hebrew word, Raphaim, which is another word for Nephilim, for thee. It stirs up these dudes, even the chief ones of the earth. It, Sheol, has raised up that from their thrones all the kingdom kings of the nations. Hmm, don't have time to go into this. It's incredibly stark what's going on here. All they shall speak and say to you, king of Babylon, are you become weak like us? Are you become like unto us? Your pomp is brought down to the grave. <laughs> Whoever this dude is, he's going to die. All the noise of your vials... Oh, and the noise of your vials are going down to the grave. The worm is spread under thee, and the worm covers thee. Remember how the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. Never mind. How are you fallen from heaven, shining one, son of the morning? There it is. Equivalency. Okay? Equivalency. Ah, wow. You just can't ask for a better show here. How are you cut down to the ground? That's the that's the image of the cutting the felling of the tree. Who did weaken the nations? For you were you've said in your heart, I will descend unto heaven. When is this happening? Day of the Lord, folks. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. Remember the sides of the north as we move on. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet, you're going to be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, which we do see in the book of Revelation where he's thrown there. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that the, made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. This is pretty global. Well, I can't say the word global. This is pretty all, all you know, encompassing here. <clears throat> Who opened not the house of his prisoners? He's a pretty cruel dude. Okay, this shining one, son of the dawn. He's a pretty cruel dude, and you, dude, and you know it from reading the context. And here we go. I, I had up here, you know that the chief ones of the earth are saying, are you become weak like one of us? And it's just, as I say here in this green, little green thing here, it's just like the Elohim in Psalm 82. And I'm just going to bring you here and show you that God 
here in Psalm 82, 1 through 8. God took his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds, holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly, you, you G-O-D-S's, you little gods, and show partiality to the wicked? Just but to give justice to the weak and the fatherless, I, I put in, you idiots. I gave you great power and, and might and glory and I gave you, well, here, you'll see it. You're supposed to maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. <laughs> These guys have neither knowledge or understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. God says, you are gods, sons of the most high, idiots, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. You will fall like any prince. You can you, you put the word human in there if you want. Arise, O oh God, that's the Messiah. Judge the earth, for you will inherit all the nations. But these other guys are the same guys referred to in Isaiah when they say, Look, we died, we were brought to the grave, you're coming down here, you're gonna are you gonna be weak like we are? Are you gonna become like one of us? Down to the grave, dead, dying, cut down, you're dead, worms are in, worms are out. The answer is yes. Lucifer. <laughs> All right, we'll finish. Isaiah 14, 18 through 32 again. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory. Sure they do. That's like, what is that, sarcasm? <clears throat> Everyone in his own house. But you, king of Babylon, are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch. You know, you know that word branch, right? Temak. The abominable branch is just counter, counter what's that, what's that counter position? to the one true branch, Messiah, the chosen one. It's got some meaning. We don't have time tonight, but let's continue. As the remnant of those that are slain thrust through with the sword, you that go down to the stones of the pit. Remember that from the uh, Lucifer thing. The pit is the side of the pit in Revelation. As a carcass trodden under feet, you will not be joined to them in burial because you destroyed your land. That's the word earth, I think, in Hebrew. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I checked it. And <laughs> slaying your people, same as the dudes in, in Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Psalm 82. The seeds of evildoers doers shall never be renowned. Uh, they're going to be brought to naught, brought to nothing. That comes up. Prepare slaughter for his children. Whose children? King of Babylon's children. Who are they? Nephilim. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquities of their fathers that do not rise. They do not rise in the resurrection, nor do they possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, cut off Babylon, the name, the remnant, the son, the nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bitter. That's another creature. Pools of water. I will sweep it with the besom of destruction. <laughs> Great mind pictures. I think that's a besom is like is like a like a, um, a broom. A besom of destruction, saith the Lord of Hosts. The Lord of Hosts has shown, shown, sworn, saying, "Surely as I have thought, so it will come to pass. And I as I have purpose, so it will stand. I will break the Assyrian in my land." That's again an historic thing where Isaiah is in. We read in Kings, he's in um, the time of Hezekiah when the Assyrian is in the land trying to break through uh, the wall of Jerusalem. So he's bringing some history back in here. And upon my mountains, I will tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart off them and his burden depart off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, not just Assyria, but the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations for the Lord of hosts has purpose, who's going to disannul it? No one. And his hand is stretched out, who will turn back? We read this. Um, in the year that the king Ahaz died was this burden, this oracle. Doesn't mean it, it, that this was historically occurring. We know that. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's fruit shall come a cockatrice. His fruit shall be like the firing, flying serpent. Serpent. The firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety. I will not uh, kill thy root with famine, and he that slays thy remnant. And here we go. Last couple of verses. Hallow gate, cry, O city. 
you whole Palestia, thou art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one that what shall one then answer the messengers in the in the Septuagint? It's the word angels, or well in Hebrew it's malach, so it's messengers. I like to see it as na- angels of the nations that the Lord has founded Zion and the poor of his people shall trust in it. They're trusting in its existence and its coming into concretion. Again, this is prophecy. Bear with me, folks. You'll see it in a moment. Here it is in the texts. How will then, how are you going to answer the Malak of the nations? Here's how you answer them. You know, the Lord's founded Zion. What's Zion? Well, Zion is the city of God. Zion, in many count- contexts, is Mount Zion. And it's sometimes it's a physical Jerusalem. Sometimes it's, by the way, the heavenly Jerusalem. And sometimes it's the people who dwell there in, um, in the future. And, you know, the people who were in Babylon were pining away for the physical Jerusalem, but they called it Zion. So, you know, you really got to cut this stuff when you're reading the word. Is it, is it the future Zion, city of God, or is it Jerusalem? And you can do it. You're equipped. You know how to read the Bible. So, and I'm going to say again, God purposed who's going to, who's going to thwart him. And I've told you that, I think this is another, the same uh, screen that I had earlier, that um, the poorest of the poor will find pasture here. Um, in Isaiah 27, uh, 32, really shows you that the city of Babylon um, is going to fall. It's in Isaiah 21, 9, literally, that it falls. And it's also a future context if you read that. But here we're looking at something that I really, <laughs> I had fun with the next couple slides. You guys like my pictures. I hope you like these. I wanted to go into the cloud of smoke that's coming from the north uh, because this is a fabulous mind picture that many prophets use about the coming destruction of Babylon. When Babylon the Great falls in the future, a cloud of smoke, <laughs> whale o gate, howl o city, verse 31, melt away, you Philistines. A cloud of smoke comes from the north. There's not a straggler in its ranks. And I told you to think, how does, a, how does a cloud of smoke have a straggler? Let's, let's think about this, okay? And we're going we're gonna to use some images. How does a cloud of smoke have stragglers? Well, usually what accompanies a cloud of smoke? Well, <laughs> I went back into the Wayback Machine, Professor uh, Peabody, uh, and I, I thought of the Lone Ranger. Remember this when you were a kid, some of you older folks? I hold silver away, and the narrator at the beginning of Every episode of The Lone Ranger, a fiery horse with the speed of light and a cloud of smoke, oh, I'm seeing dust, and a hearty, high oh, silver The Lone Ranger, and the bad guy in jail says, who was that mess? Law enforcement officer says, I don't know, but I've heard him called The Lone Ranger. And I checked the Aramaic on this, <laughs> and the word dust is smoke. I'm telling you right now, it's smoke. All right, cloud of smoke. I know it doesn't explain it, but, you know, Jesus Pretty, pretty much typically did it alone, and uh, he was the Lone Ranger. And all of our heroes, I'm just a little, little brief aside here, take a breath. We'll get back into the context of Babylon in a minute. But all of our heroes are, mod- are modern, modeled after a certain individual. Mm. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal man. He was, yes, he was, supernatural. And yes, he was a type of Jesus in the media. So I want to get back into this. I don't want you to lose sight of the cloud of smoke. I'm going back to the, the slide of a of cloud of smoke that's coming from the north, and there's not a straggler in its ranks. So what accompanies a cloud of smoke? It's usually, shall I say, horse and at least in ancient times, what comes from the north? From the north come the boys. I'm calling them the boys. And I just pick some images because, you know, 
I have an image of this as I'm reading the Bible. It's like when you read Lord of the Rings. Uh, you have the same image that came with the movie. And I, don't, I know it's not going to do justice to what's going to happen in the future, but I'm going to give you a couple of what I figure are pretty good mind pictures of a cloud coming from the north. And I told you to keep in mind what's in the north, because what? Things in the north are spiritual in the Bible. They're very spiritual. And you saw that if you listen to my Lucifer versus Jesus, where the shining one, son of the, son of the, um, son of the dawn, goes to the recesses of the north to try to usurp the power of God. And Zaphon, the, the Hebrew word for north, is a mountain in Syria. And the mountain for the ancients held spiritual significance. The mountain is the garden uh, in Ezekiel. You know, the garden of God in, in the mountain. So what's coming from the north? Cloud of smoke and a hidey high old silver. Well, okay, there's another good one. <laughs> Somebody took these pictures. I thought they were pretty cool. I just thought we'd have a brief aside here. Yep, get back into the scriptures in one minute. Great cloud coming. I, I, this next one, though, from Independence Day, this is the big one. This is the one that's going to have meaning to you in a few slides, okay? All right, let's get, let's get real. It's kind of biblical. It's kind of biblical. We go to the book of Revelation. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and them that sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Sound familiar? Sound like Isaiah? His eyes were a flame of fire. His head, or On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God, and the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with, <clears throat> that with it he would smite or should smite the nations. Those wascally nations, that's a whole other teaching. What's going on in Palestine in the future and gathering into Palestine? Anyway, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God because he's doing it for God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. If you've ever heard my teaching about the word thigh from the Aramaic, it's the word banner. Some night I'll teach that whole thing. He has Jesus. Yeah, you got the picture. It's a Jesus thing coming from heaven. He's been up there for a while. He comes back with the posse. Yes, we'll get into that. It's in Thessalonians. The angels of his might follow him on white horses, and he has on his vesture, okay, and on his banner is the word. A name written, and that's a whole other teaching about what, why it's a banner and better too, but not tonight. So the scene is mentioned here. I said Thessalonians, and you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, that's two Thessalonians one seven and eight. For those of you who don't have the video here, um, in flaming fire, there it is, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I showed you in the Pit of Despair web acts a couple months ago that this, of course, includes spirits, men that know not God, and humans, but angels get a lot of ink in that category. So back again to the one picture that I liked a lot when I was just trying to think of what to show you. <coughs> Ezekiel says it. I looked, and behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, a bright light around it in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of that fire. I, I, I didn't make this up, folks. Read the context of these verses I'm throwing at you. Don't just take my word for it. Read the context of Ezekiel 1. Here's another one coming from the north. Verse Focuses on the leader here. I have aroused one 
from the north, Isaiah 41, 25. And he has come, by God he's come, from the rising of the sun, he will call on my name, he will come upon the rulers, that's the word princes, I believe, as upon mortar and as the potter treads clay. Here's another one, back to the army. I gave you the leader, I will. We had the army. <laughs> oh, man, here's back to the, the host. Uh, Jeremiah 50, 41, 42. Look, an army is coming from the north. There it is. Some of it's literal, some of it's figurative. You know, a cloud of smoke. And, you know, here it is, really. An army is coming from the north. Oh, here, a great nation. And the kings are stirred up from the ends of the earth. They are armed with bows and spears. They are cruel without mercy. They sound like the roaring of the sea as they ride their horses. By the way, they come like men. Read that. Okay, it says nation, I understand, but it's they are like men. They come like men in a board in a battle formation to attack you. Oh daughter of Babylon. There we go. Back to the context. I tried to make these things fun. Okay, one last reference to the north and it's very important. Therefore behold the days come. Which days? Day of the Lord, folks. Those days in which God will bring vengeance upon all those that know not God. That I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon. Hmm. And her whole land shall be confounded. And all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon. Uh, hi, Babylon. For the spoilers... There's a better translation for that word. The word destroyers. I think the NIV has destroyers. I like the word destroyers. The destroyer shall come unto her from the north. And Babylon, as Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Ye that have escaped the sword, go away, stand not still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come into your mind. Uh, it, this is just, you, you got to just keep reading the word to get in the context here. We're going to get into Jeremiah 51 just a bit. <laughs> I'll just get, and I gave a little note here at the bottom. This is a research night, so, and I'm not getting into all the prophecies of Gog and Magog and who's coming in where and from the east, north, you know. I just wanted to focus a little bit um, to show you that the spiritual entities are coming from the north. Yeah, and the nations, uh, you've got to understand that they're, 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 they're uh, inextricably linked. The nations are coming, uh, excuse me, the spiritual entities are coming because the nations are coming. Why are they coming? Because those spiritual entities are governing those geographical locations. So it's tit for tat. It's the same thing. The nations come, the spoilers come. Those jerks that govern, you know, read Daniel 10, the guys that wouldn't let the messenger visit Daniel. What was his name? The Prince of, was it the Prince of Tyre or Greece? Well, they're both in there. Anyway, we read it last time. But here, just for you, you Bible geeks, Gog and Magog come from the north. Read Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 20. Um, I, I imagine some of you may be a little disappointed with this very factual teaching tonight that it doesn't get speculative about, you know, the mystery Babylon or the, <clears throat> you know, who's what, where, and what locust looks like a helicopter. I'm not into that stuff in the book of Revelation. But I give you some stuff to do your own work. The whole subject is about Gentile cities and countries and their handlers. I like that word. I remember that word their handlers <laughs> in Israel and their Messiah, who is their handler. Israel's Messiah is Israel's handler. Well, let's get back to this. Maybe I'm a little bit wacky, but Babylon after the captivity. The prophecies of Jeremiah 50 and 51, over 100 verses. I promise not to read them all. I promised John Lynn today I wouldn't read them all. He told me, just pick the highlights, Bob. And I said, I'm trying. I needed a couple more hours to just pick the highlights. That's not the right spelling of the word excerpts. That's the spelling of the word excerpts. So we're going to read a few excerpts from 
uh, from the uh, Jeremiah 15:51. Now Jeremiah lived during the captivity and after the captivity of the Babylon captivity we speak of 200 years previously in Isaiah. Most people, uh, I said I wouldn't get into it, I guess I put a note here. Most people these days want the reference in the book of Revelation to Babylon to be Rome. Let's stop the insanity right now. Rome is not the subject of God's interest in Scripture. Okay, I tried to get into that a little bit. Okay, we'll get into that just a hair near the end, but we're going to stick in Jeremiah 50 and 51 for a few minutes. Okay, I think I got four slides. We'll read quickly and carefully. Jeremiah 50, 1 through 5. The word of the Lord was, uh, <clears throat> spoke, the word which the Lord spoke concerning what? Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans through Jeremiah. Declare and proclaim among the nations. Proclaim it, lift up the standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel, one of the gods of Babylon, has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. We'll get into that a little. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols have been shattered. Sounds pretty spiritual. For a nation has come up, <laughs> there it is, against her, out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror. You know, the prophets didn't mince words. They, all the gore is here. There will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off. They've gone away in those days. And at that time, declares the Lord, the sons of Israel will come. Both they and the sons of Judah will be as well. And they will go along weeping as they go. It will be the Lord their God, they will seek. Where are they going to go? They will ask for the way to Zion. Okay? All right. Yes. This occurred after the Babylonian captivity. They asked the way to the physical Jerusalem. But, folks, I'm telling you right now, these two chapters are not about the physical Jerusalem. We're going to get into that. They turn their face in its direction. They will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgiven. That's the first little excerpt. Now we're going to skip about 20 verses, go to the next one. <laughs> the noise of, and it, it, I wanted to read the whole thing, but we just don't have the time, and I, I, I probably can't make it live for you. Just read it to yourself out loud. The noise of battles in the land and great destruction. This is great. I love this mind picture. The hammer of the whole earth has been cut off and broken. How Babylon has become an object of horror among the nations. I will, I set a snare for you, and you were caught, O oh Babylon, while you yourself were not even aware. You have been found and also seized because what? You have engaged in conflict with the Lord. This is spiritual stuff here. The Lord has opened his armory. Oh, I love this. And he has brought forth the weapons of his indignation, for it is a work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans, God of the armies. What are those guys? Those are the Kodeshim. Those are the armies. That's the angels. <laughs> Come to her, verse 26. From the farthest border, open up her barns, pile up like heap, pile her up like heaps, utterly destroy her. Let nothing be left to her. Does it sound like? Well, we'll get into that. Come, nothing be left to her. Put all her young bulls to the sword. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe be upon them, for their day has come. The time of their punishment. There is a sound of fugitives and refugees from the land of ba Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord uh, our God, vengeance for his temple. This is future, folks. This is future, okay? Here we go. A couple more excerpts. I promised I wasn't going to read the whole thing, John. Behold, I'm against you, 5031. Oh, arrogant one. Now we're talking about a dude. We're not talking about a land or a city. How do we do that? Well, you have to read the whole context. You'll see it switches. I am against you, O arrogant one, declares the Lord God of hosts, for your day is come. The time when I will punish you personally. Behold, 50 verses 
chapter 15, verse 41 to 43, a people is coming from the north. How many times are you going to read this? A great nation, many kings will be around. We did read this. Um, they shall seize bow and javelin. They are cruel, have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. Hmm. They ride on horses, marshaled like a man for battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. What? The king of Babylon has heard a report about them, <laughs> what do you think? And his hands hang limp. Uh, distress has gripped him. Agony like a woman in childbirth. Where have we heard of the king of Babylon before? Hmm, same dude that's in Isaiah 14, 4 through 6. I will take up your, this taunt against the king of Babylon. How has the oppressor ceased? How has the fury ceased? The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, wicked the step, scepter of the rulers, which used, he, which used to strike the people in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unstrained persecution, that's the shining one, son of the dawn, king of Babylon, same as in Jeremiah. We'll see some more of it. I'm not just going to pull the plug here. Uh, there's always this not yet, now not yet aspect in scripture. You'll love this. Jeremiah 51. Are we in the next? Yeah, I went to the next chapter. Okay, we're in 51. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you save your life. Flee, flee, go away. Do not be destroyed in her punishment. <coughs> Or this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He's going to render, render recompense to her. Read it. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. Now we're sounding a little bit like the book of Revelation, aren't we? The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. All the nations, right? Suddenly, Babylon is fallen and has been broken. Wail over her. Bring a bomb for her pain. Perhaps she's going to be healed. We applied the healing to Babylon. Oh, I'm so surprised she was not healed. Forsake her. Let us each go to his own country, for her judgment has reached to heaven and powers up to the very skies. Do you think Jeremiah knew his Bible? He remembers Babel. He remembers the tower reaching to heaven. He knew your Bible. Jeremiah knew what he, and Jeremiah and Isaiah quote from the book of Genesis tons. Okay? All right, one of few more excerpts. I promised I wouldn't read the whole. Isaiah, excuse me, Jeremiah 51, 14 through 19. Lord of hosts, sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with a population like locusts, and they will cry out with shouts of victory over you. I love battle, battle on. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, God, and his understanding he stretched out the heavens like a tent. It sells elsewhere a firmament. He, when he utters his voice, there is a tumult like waters of waters in the heavens. Those of you who know about the celestial sea, and he causes the clouds to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for rain, brings forth the wind from the storehouses, all mankind is stupid. You think? That's what it said. I didn't write the book. All mankind is stupid. Devoid of knowledge. This is, I don't even, I think this is NASB. I think this is NASB. I love this. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idol. Stupid. His molten images are deceitful. Stupid man. And there is no breath in them, the idols. Brief aside here, are, there are breath in those which they represent, but there's nothing in the image itself. They're, they are worthless, a work of mockery. In the time of their punishment, they will perish, be destroyed. The portion of Jacob is not like these, for the maker of all is he. And of the tribe of his inheritance, the Lord of hosts is his name. I told you last session, Babylon, the greatest fallen session one, that God chose Israel, <clears throat> called the tribe here. <clears throat> After this little section that I quote here, and I'm not going to read it, it gets gruesome. You can read it yourself. It gets gruesome. But the last little bit about Babylon, we're all the way to chapter 51, verses 42, 45. <laughs> Again, Jeremiah lays his present situations regarding Babylon. If you read verse 34, he mentions Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 41, Shishak, uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, 
but the flavor, again, is still the day of the Lord. And you really have to put on your thinking caps here, Tom Terrific. Babylon, and we'll read here, the next verse, is no, nowhere near the sea. Yet Jeremiah says this. The sea has come over Babylon. Hmm. She is engulfed with its tumultuous waves. Her cities have become an object of, there it is, horror. A parched land in a desert. Wait a minute, you just told me there's water. Nah, it's not physical water. Um, <clears throat> a land in which no man lives and through which no son of man passes. And here we have this other verse. I will punish Bel and Babylon. I will make what he has swallowed come out of his mouth. The nations will no longer stream to him. We're getting pretty spiritual here. How am I going to explain this to you? Even the wall of Babylon has fallen down. Babylon the Great has fallen. Come forth from her midst, my people, meaning Israel. And each of you save yourselves from the fierce anger of the Lord. I just threw another verse here for those of you who want to get into this. Revelation 12, 15. And the serpent poured water like river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. Go to that. Go to chapter 12 in Revelation and read about the uh, the woman and the uh, serpent. But here it's Bell. <laughs> I will make what he has swallowed come out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. You think there might be something equal there? We're not getting into that speculation tonight, but you do the math. Okay, really, really end times. Promise, promise, last one. Is it the last one? Mm, yes, it is the last one. Uh, Jeremiah 51, 47, 56. Therefore, behold, the days are coming when I will punish the idols of Babylon. If you read the book of Revelation, it's very religiously oriented, Babylon the Great. Then we'll get into a little of that. And her whole land, Babylon, would be put to shame. All her slain will fall in her midst, then heaven and earth, and all that in them is, <clears throat> all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon for the, oh, here it is, the destroyers will come to her <coughs> from the north, declares the Lord. Indeed, Babylon is to fall for the slain of Israel, and also for Babylon, the slain of all the earth have fallen. You who have escaped the sword, depart, do not stay. Remember the Lord from afar. <laughs> Remember the Lord from a star, and let Jerusalem come to your mind. Ye, uh, we are ashamed because we have heard reproach, disgrace has covered our faces, for aliens have entered the holy places of the Lord's house. This has to do with the historical Babylon coming into the temple, taking out all the treasure and bringing it back to Babylon. So again, Jeremiah is reading the historical into the future, just be aware, be aware of this, and therefore, verse 52, uh, four, yeah, 52, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish her idols, and the mortally wounded will groan throughout her land, though Babylon should ascend to heaven, there it is again, he knows his Bible, there's the tower image, and though she should fortify her lofty stronghold from me, Destroyers will come to her, declares the Lord. The sound of outcry from Babylon and of great destruction from the land of Chaldees. For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon. He will make her loud noise vanish from her. And their waves will roar like the many or the great waters. The tumult of their voices sounds forth. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon and her mighty men will be captured, their bows will sh will be sh are, are shattered, and the Lord is the God of recompense. He will fully repay, and here's a little glimpse of it for you. I just thought I would point out that sometimes, you know, you read this stuff and it's just wacky. Again, weird is good. I told you that's one of my favorite keys to interpretation. Weird is good. Then you really got to think about it and work stuff. When the Lord in verse 55 says, their ways will, war, will roar like great or many waters, the tumult of their voices sounds forced. That's a parallelism in the Hebrew for the destroyers coming against her. 
Waves in scripture oftentimes depict spiritual entities. I'm not crazy here, folks. I have a whole chapter on this in my book, No More Sea. Again, the waves are depicted in Job 9. I'm just giving you the scriptures here. You go there, you read them. If you want to talk to me about it on the internet, uh, I mean, via email, please write. But Job 9, 4, 8 through, uh, 4, Job 9, 4 through 8, Psalm 89, 8 through 11, and Isaiah 51, 9 through 16 for further study shows you that the waves are these spiritual entities. And if you're, if you're further interested in that, in the seminar, No More See, when we get to doing something with it, the reason Jesus walked on the water was because of what's said in Job 9, where God tramples the tumultuous waves of the celestial sea. So Jesus, a man after God's own heart, like father, like son, walked on the waves of the sea of Galilee and calmed them down. That whole image is Hebraic. Okay, Bob, so there you go. Babylon's going to get destroyed. Where are we going? Are we ever going to get to Mystery Babylon? Well, we got a few more slides. we got about ten whole more minutes. <laughs> I wanted to say one thing before we get there, because we can go fairly quickly to the end. Babylon in the Christian scriptures, there's only one place that the word Babylon occurs in the Christian scriptures. It's in 1 Peter 5, 12 through 14. So we're going to read it. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church which is at Babylon, elect together with you, salutes you, and so does Marcus, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ. You know it's Christian, in Christ Jesus. Amen. One place in the Christian scriptures. But theologians, given this one place in the Christian scriptures, they go to the moon, folks. They tell you, and I just quoted here just one little <laughs> one little commentary just so you see that this is what the theological world does with the one place, which by the way is physical Babylon. I've showed you that Babylon, maybe I didn't show you, but Babylon re remained active as a a, a, a bastion of, he, of Jewish activity right through the apostolic age, way through the first second, third centuries, um, the great works, I think I show them to you later, the, the Babylonian Talmud, the Targum Onkelos were written in Babylon by Jews. So Peter went there to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wrote from there the gospel, you know, the, the message here where he says, I'm writing to you from Babylon, <clears throat> or I'm giving you their greetings. But here... In the commentary, Robertson's word studies, <laughs> just read with me. She that is in Babylon, elect together with you. Uh, to either actual Babylon, the guy says, or most likely it's the mystical Babylon. Bro, how does he get that? There is no way he gets that. I'm not even going to give it the light of day here. You read it when you get the slides from me. It's just stupid. <laughs> and kind of stupid. Uh, and they can't read. They can't. <sighs> Some of you that have been taught that the Rome is the Babylon the Great, it, you just got to be careful when you're reading the Bible that you don't read into it. Read what's written. Babylon is Babylon. Why I ever say that? Okay, so part, <laughs> part two, Mystery Babylon. We finally got there. Uh, what's up with this name? How did it come to pass? It's used once in the Bible, but it spawned innumerable books, bo innumerable books on Rome. Um, and here's the here's the place. The woman, Revelation 17, 4 through 6. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned in gold and precious stones and pearls, having her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her, her immorality, and on her forehead a name written, a mystery. Uh, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. I just want to say something. <laughs> it's capitalized here, but it's, it, you know, the original didn't have capitalization. <clears throat> Again, this is research. I'm quoting here another commentary just so you get. 
they've taken that one verse, Babylon the Great, or maybe it's, yeah, and they've exploded it into how the name Babylon is to be interpreted mystically or spiritually. Because, you know, they've determined that it's Rome, and by God, we're going to shove this interpretation down your throats. I haven't got time to dissuade you of that issue, except to say that, finally, Babylon is Babylon. It's not Rome. You'll read that it's Jerusalem. It's not Jerusalem. It's not New York City. I read an article that said it was New York City this week. I just had to laugh. Babylon is Babylon. Most times it's the city. Sometimes it's the kingdom. We saw that just by reading Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, uh, note that Babylon has been given a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth, Jeremiah 51, 7. All the nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are going mad. We read that, right? Um, so, I'm not sure why I put that last in here. Let me erase it. Um, but, but look, <laughs> I'm going to take it a little further. I, I'm going to go down and, and when I eventually get this thing here. Babylon, city and kingdom, is a counterfeit. Physically, politically, Alana, remind me to remove slide 53 and put it where it should be. Babylon is a counterfeit physically, politically, religiously to that which God had planned many years before. Remember that Isaiah was already looking for the, the right city before Abraham ever was. I'm just going to try to move this while I'm working here. Um, let's see. Bear with me, folks, so we get this right, um, because you know where I'm going with this. Um, okay, so Babylon is Babylon. I moved the slide. It's often the city, often the kingdom. But look, it's a counterfeit to the real city. What's the real city? Zion. By faith, Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, when he was called to go out of the place which afterwards he should receive an inheritance, and obeyed, he went out, not knowing where the hell he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, tents with Isaac and Jacob, he didn't even build anything, and the heirs uh, with him of that promise. But what he was, he was looking for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just after God took full responsibility, let's call it oversight, as the most high, of the future nature of it, nation of Israel. Progressive revelation tells us there's much more. There's much more about this city. Let's read a few things. Sarah. Hebrews 11, that was, for those of you who are listening on the radio, that was Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. We're going to lead, read verses 11 through 16. So Sarah, through herself, received strength to conceive seed, was delivered of the child, past age, judged to some faithful who had promised, therefore sprang, uh, therefore sprang there even of one, you know, Christ line, and him as good as dead, as so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and the stand which is by the sea, Sure, innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off. What promises? What promises? And they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. The word patris, a homeland, a hometown, literally fatherland. They're looking for it, that say these things, that they're looking and they're, they're looking, they're persuaded of these promises. And truly, verse 15 of Hebrews 11, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly ellipsis country. Therefore, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, or what? He hath prepared for them a city. Okay? 
I wanted to point out the little green statement here that had they thought about it, they might have returned to where they had been. You know that happened a couple times. When they were leaving the country of Egypt, there, and I just quoted Acts 7 here for you, they wanted, a lot of them wanted to go back. But those who were faithful, the believers, look for a city whose builder and maker is God. And God calls it a heavenly one, okay? And heavenly, I'll highlight, I'll make it blue. I know you guys love it when I highlight and make them bold. Well, the whole thing, Bob. Um, <laughs> I'm screwing up here. We'll go to the next slide. Chapter 12, verse 18 through 29. For you, Jewish Christians, to whom Paul is writing here, have not come to a mountain that can be touched with it and do blazing fire. Uh, we're going to go over tonight on the uh, WebEx. It's already an hour and a half. We're going a little further. <clears throat> you haven't come to the mountain that can't be that can be touched into the blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind, into the blast of the trumpet, the sounds of words, which sound was such that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them. They were scared crazily. <laughs> You, you Christians, Jewish Christians, remember, Jewish Christians, you haven't come to the mountain. Who did? Hebrews, Israelites, coming out of the land of the promise, coming out of the land of Egypt toward the land of promise. For they, those guys, could not even bear the command, um, if even a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I'm full of fear and trembling, but you, Jewish Christians, have come to Mount Zion. How, 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 how did they do that? You have come to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriad of angels, to the generally assemble, general, general assembly, and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled, written in the public record like a deed, in heaven, and to God. You've come to these, to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, literally, it's two spirits, mainly the made perfect righteous ones. And to Jesus, the mediator of, new, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks to them uh, better than the blood of Abel, to see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking right now. He's speaking to you, Jewish Christians, to whom I'm writing in the book of Hebrews. For if those guys back in the Hebrew scriptures did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven how's he doing that <laughs> well, we'll think about this a lot and his voice shook the earth then but now he's promised saying yet once more I'm going to shake the only not only the earth but I'm going to shake heaven this expression quote yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's the new heavens and new earth that are coming. Therefore, since we receive, the word is our receiving, a kingdom. By the way, Jewish Christians will be receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You know it. So but back to the blue part. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. How have you done that? To the heavenly Jerusalem. How have you come there? By mental, not gymnastics, by mental fortification. You know Zion is coming. You know it's the city of the living God. And if you hold on a minute, I'm going to show you how it comes down from heaven. You get to be part of it and are in it. The heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels. Yeah, they're there. So the general, general assembly, that's the council. That's the divine council. Church of the firstborn. Yes, angels were first created. That's the assembly of the firstborn. Those who are enrolled in heaven. They're there now. They're in the public record. They're now. And to God, he's up there now, judge of all. He's up there now. Spirits of the righteous made perfect. Everybody wants that to be humans. They're not. Literally, spirits. Namely, the made righteous, perfect, righteous ones who are in heaven. And to Jesus, who's also in heaven right now. So you've got all these guys in heaven right now. Remember when you're reading that there. 
if I'm going too fast, listen to this again. Still speaking to Jewish Christians, Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. Let's go out to him outside the camp. This is Hebraic thinking, okay? He knows his audience understands the Hebrew scriptures. Let's go outside the camp bearing his reproach from here for here on this earth. We do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking that which is to come, a city, that which is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name. Speak in tongues, please. And do not neglect doing good or sharing, for such sacrifices is God will please. So, there's a city coming that is the hope of all believers. Yes, Gentiles will get in. I'm going to show you that. What could possibly turn someone away from such a glorious hope? A counterfeit. Babylon. Okay? And here, I don't think I'm going to put this one in here right now. I'll come back to it, maybe. Ephesians, you know this one. Okay? He, God, is or Jesus, is our peace who made both one. Ephesians 2, 14 through 22. Okay? We're fellow citizens. You know this verse having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, were to make it himself in twain. Oh, the great one, new man, who was the colonel of the secret, so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body <laughs> by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were far off, Gentiles, and to them which were nigh, Jews. And through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, Ephesians, Gentiles, who, to whom Paul is writing, but you're, oh, by the way, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Citizens, 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 citizens and are built upon the foundation of the apostle and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone of what? <laughs> In whom the, all the building, there it is, next verse, fitly framed together grows unto the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for an habitation of God. I have a note here that says, read it when you get this slide, it says, the text here doesn't say that we're fellow citizens with Israel, but NIV says, kind of that. It says fellow citizens with God's people. It, it screws up. It's fellow citizens with the saints. That means everybody who believes. That means pre-Israel, post-Israel, all Israel, you know, believers. It doesn't mean we're fellow citizens only with Israel. Abraham was not an Israelite. He was an Abraham. He was pre-Israel. He was a saint. He had the vision of the city whose builder and maker was God. Am I going too fast? Philippians, our citizenship, our polituma, our commonwealth is in heaven. Hmm, by the way, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord, the Savior, excuse me, a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, we read the commonwealth um, was there, okay? We see often in, this, in the heavenlies that God's, you know, has a, a, a shadow of things to come. But now in Christ it says that those believers, the Ephesians believers, the Gentiles who were in Christ, they got in. They're fellow citizens, right? That I mentioned just in passing that I believe when that which is perfect has come is the heavenly Jerusalem. Put that in your pipe for a while. Smoke it. Get back to me. But I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I'm right. I don't think it's Jesus. That which is a that which. Jesus is a he who. It's in the text. Heavenly Jerusalem doesn't stay in heaven, though, does it? Finally, we get to the verse that's this. One of my favorites. That which is perfect is coming. I saw a new heaven and earth, Revelation 21, 1 through 10, where the first heaven and earth are passed away, and there was no more sea. For those of you who love the celestial sea, it's no longer there because it doesn't keep us separated from God anymore, which was, which it was its original purpose. And, Genesis 1, I think it's 3 through 6, the waters above the firmament. There's no more separation between God and us because why? 
John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. There it is. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven. saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. We're back in business. We can walk in the garden and talk with them again. And they shall be his people and God himself. I should highlight. God, I love this. God himself shall be with them. He's back and be their God. God will wipe away tears. On and on and on. At the bottom, he says, John, verse 10, says, He carried me away in the spirit to the great high mountain, showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. See how it changed? Holy city to holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So, I'm going to go real quickly through that. The properties of Babylon, maybe I'll put this up in the other section. No, I'll leave it here. Interpretation has been made more difficult by the varied meanings of Babylon itself. Sometimes the term Babel in Hebrew refers to the city whose history continued and was flourishing even during the apostolic period when it became a center of Jewish learning after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Babylonian Targum Onkelos, for those of you who are familiar with that, a Targum is the Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Scriptures. Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Babylonian Talmud Bavli, which is a commentary, basically, on the Hebrew Scriptures, are great examples of that which came out of the actual physical Babylonian city that existed even after John wrote the book of Revelation. So Babylon is Babylon. Quit trying to make it Rome. And we know Peter went there. Sometimes the term is used in a reference to the political economic power of Babylon, which obviously fell in one night historically when the Medes and Persians took control of Babylon. That's a whole other teaching, and it's refer it's mentioned in Daniel. Yet if you read the Hebrew prophets and see the future of Babylon has political might too, John Rowlett, the Revelator shows this influence. Well, there's only a couple more slides, folks. Sometimes it's used of the religious spiritual sense, for Babylon has been the fountain of many of the false religions which have competed with Judaism and Christian faith ever since its existence um, during the time of, of Isaiah. And we know the roots of it go all the way back into the time of Nimrod, the giant. And as I say, it's most easily seen in Isaiah. Jeremiah. It's also in Zechariah. It's also in a, a bunch of the other, we call them minor prophets. They weren't minor. But let's finally get to some of the stuff in Revelation. And we got two more, two more slides. But Babylon in the last book of Scripture, what does that quote-unquote look like? Here's the verses you want to put in your, your scriptural, scriptural pipe and smoke them. And eventually, you know, maybe we'll have a session where we peel back in more detail the spiritual uh, corruption, which is Babylon the Great. <laughs> Quote, with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Sounds like Jeremiah. That's Revelation 17, 12. For the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. Revelation 18, 3. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, that's a one-time, at the apex legomena, as they say, a one-time usage of a word in the Greek. Go look at it. Look it up. That's a, that's a bad word right there. They shared her luxury. They see the smoke of her burning. <laughs> They're going to weep and mourn over her. Why, you ask? Why? Well, because she was everything to them, <clears throat> spiritually. Salvation and glory, Revelation 19, 1 and 2. And power belong to our God, for the true, just are his judgments, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute, which of course is the whole subject of 17 and 18 of Revelation, who corrupted the earth by her adultery. So I'm giving you a couple of verses here to show you that when you work this stuff, and you're going to work this stuff, because the, the, the reason for 
sometimes the reason for these rel these these um, research nights is not to give you all the answers. It's to give you fuel for your own fire, for you to work some of this stuff. Get back to me and find out if this stuff is fitting or if it's not. Tell me. Jeremiah 52, Bell has been put to shame. Marduk, Marduk has been shattered. Sound spiritual to you? These are the gods, literally gods. They existed. These aren't idols. These aren't, these are spiritual entities. They've been shattered. That's why God condemns the great prostitute. That's why the city slash kingdom of Babylon falls. Just like the king of Babylon, Isaiah 14, falls. But when does he fall? Read your Bible in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation 20 and realize that the dragon, who is the shining one, son of the dawn in, in Isaiah 14, doesn't get the boot out of heaven until the end times. Isaiah 13, 11, I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance and of the haughty. I will humble the pride of the ruthless. I, I almost want to make a bumper sticker out of that. I was talking to a lot of this week about it. That's what's going to happen. <coughs> okay, <coughs> two more slides. I'm just going to rush through this one because it will come out on the PDF if you want it. Really, really end times. Day of the Lord. You got seven years of really bad luck. Then Jesus comes back and he ain't blowing kisses. Three, a thousand years of truth, justice, and the godly way. Then the dragon gets loose for a season. I should have put in here two, under two, is that actually the dragon <laughs> um, falls. Because five, exit the dragon, is when he gets out of the pit and is actually is taken out. God takes him out. And then six, there's a whole lot of shaking going on because God shakes both heaven, uh, earth and heaven, we read, and the Babylon the Great falls right there because he shakes both earth and heaven. And the new heavens and the earth come, and then the new covenant comes into effect. Um, these, this is just a quick, <laughs> quick really end times uh, brush. So, last slide, folks, and then we'll let you get to bed. It's a little long tonight, but I, I just wanted to put as much as I could into your hands in <laughs> future study. What is this spiritual? I think we can quantify it last week. Adultery. I think we can use the word spiritual adultery committed by the kings of the earth. Do we share in the lux luxury, as it stated in that one verse in, in Revelation? I, I, I want to work on it. Kings of the earth, I told you. They're not always human. I'm telling you right now, they're not always human. And you can, I can prove that to you biblically. And, and yet, many times they are. Uh, both Jeremiah, next one, in the book of Revelation, God commands or adjures his people to come out of her, Babylon. And there's the references if you want to check them. Please check them. I go through so many of these commentaries. I have to to make sure I'm somewhat on the right track. I mean, there's godly men that went before me, but they just speculate, and they pull New York into the context, and the, the United States, and Iraq, and Afghanistan. Please stop it. Don't be a stupid human, like it said in the book of, book of uh, Jeremiah, okay? The humans are stupid. What happened? You know, why does God call the believers out of her. Why is she a her? Why is it in Revelation a woman riding on the beast with a scarlet cloak and all this stuff? And the beast's got seven heads. I can get into this sometime, but it just it's way too much to do right now, and I don't think it's worth that much. In other words, why you know what happened and what does God want these people to do? How do they come out from Babylon. I think it's worth studying that. How do you get out of it? It's all about arrogance, evil, haughtiness, and how God intends to stop it. That's why I quoted that thing from the other verse. I love that verse. 
I got to go back to it. I'll have Mark put it in. I will punish Isaiah thirteen eleven. The world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. That's why when you read Isaiah 14, how has the oppressor ceased? How have you fallen, <laughs> you know, king of Babylon? Uh, I just wanted to read something from James 4.12, and we'll end it here. Oh, yeah, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who, who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, uh, today and tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be tomorrow, Mr. Haughty. You are just a vapor. Sound like Ecclesiastes? That appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live, also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, such as boasting is evil, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's sin. Get that. Let's learn the right thing for our lives. I'm not you, you're not me. You don't have my ministry. I don't have yours. You're way better at yours than I'm at, you know, at yours. I'm good at mine. I want to get better. We learn our individual ministries. We learn the right things for my life, and we do it, okay? Because if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Then it's not sin, but it's hitting the mark. God has no hands but our hands. Okay, there's angels. They come about when we pray, so he has angel hands at times. But to activate that, we have to do something. So do it. Find your ministry and do it with all your might. And boy, oh boy, I'm going to tell you, things will change in your life. Don't just say, tomorrow I'm just going to go to such and such and spend a year engaging business, business and make profit. That's not it, folks. God prospers you in your way. The great verse in 3 John 2 about that prospers in your way, in your hodos, in the way. But if you want to really be prospered, you know, God feeds the birds. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. The, Let's learn the right thing for our life and not struggle to do someone else's gift or to try to have someone else's gift. You are the only you God has. <laughs> Make it count where you are. You know, what are, what are these, what's that? Thing? Um, grow where you're planted. Yeah, grow where you're planted. You know, do that and, and you'll be successful. And, uh, I'm going to close this tonight by asking those of you who have been prospered physically, help us. We want to get more of this stuff on on uh, electronic media. I'm asking you to to pray for this ministry because we really have some stuff to say. We really have some stuff to teach so that you can can fire up your own ministry and do the right thing for yourself. And it's not always going to be engaged in business and make a profit, but by the way, some of you are really good at that, and you've already been prospered and you're helping us, so thanks for that, and thanks for whatever you can do to help us move this kind of stuff forward, and I hope to teach more spiritual stuff. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm on a roll, but I, I, I've got some stuff on the, on the Divine Council that I've been teaching for the last two or three years here, and I want to continue to bring it forth. And to do that, we need your help. So please help us. And, and John Lynn, next month, going to be teaching Diameter of the Ages. Anything you can do to help us on that, we'd gratefully appreciate it. But I just want to say to you guys all, don't be be coachable. You know, what? I did use the word coachable up there above. How do you become coachable to the voice of God and the voice of Jesus, right? Because our fellowship is with both of them. Don't forget it. They both, 
you know, can speak into your life, just be sensitive. Um, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. So we stop singing, sinning, singing, <laughs> we start to sing, our life sings. We stop sinning and bringing disgrace to God. We get out of Babylon and we get into God's heavenly city in our minds. You have not come to the mount which is shaking, but you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, in your brain. Honestly, I tell you, that's what that context is saying. You're, you're there. You're there. Where you're going. You're a believer. You've been, you know, Hebrews, <laughs> there's seed. You have seed. You're in Christ. If you're reading Hebrews 11, you've come unto the holy city. You're going there. You can't miss it. So get it in your brain that you're, you know, God is coming back to the planet, not just Jesus. He's coming, Jesus is coming, and then God is coming and is bringing his city with him, of which you are part. Music